so I had I did have comments about uh, surveillance in general and as a means of social control, and I did want to talk about that. But uh, first, I just had a question about Odavenga at the Bronx Zoo. Um, you did you yeah. mentioned you mentioned something that's interesting an interesting take on this, which is that the zoo, the Bronx Zoo and, and just zoos in general and also learned societies, let's just say, of the turn of the century, were extractive mm -hmm. and vestiges of colonialism. But since that time, uh, they've, they've kind of taken it on, on themselves to be uh, conservationists, which is just like a you know, relatively newer uh, paradigm, um, even though it, it, in some ways they played a part in diminishing a lot of the populations of certain animals, creatures, plants, um, Right, the things that the very same things that they display, right? But my question is, exactly. you know, we're all we're now like 115 years past when Odavenga Ota, lived in the zoo. Has the Bronx Zoo, or by extension, the Wildlife Conservation Society, to your knowledge, made any amends for what is essentially an incredibly racist and problematic uh, display? <laughs> yeah. Um... It's funny because they it, very recently in the last two years, they did um, acknowledge and apologize. Um, I think this was in the wake of this kind of transformative moment where the George Floyd case took on this, right. you right. know, um, enormous reckoning with uh, racism in America and its yeah. um, long, you know, history. And I think, um, you know, it's ironic, too, that this has come to visibility because through, you know, these devices, right, through yeah. um, a citizen reporting this incident, yeah. that has probably has taken place hundreds, if not that hundreds of thousands of times, right, in, in, in America. Yeah. Um, and so they did then they, they did make public all of the records regarding Odebenga. Um, so all of the, the correspondence between Phillips Werner and, uh, and William Hornaday, who was the director of the New York Zoological Society, have been made public. And they apologized for it. I mean, I think what I really, and I was, have you know got to know one of the archivists um, very closely uh, through my research there, and you know we were thinking um, you know it, they really should do an exhibition and have uh, That's a good idea yeah you know a a statue built to this kind of because it's interesting they still have a very close relationship with the Congo and with Mbuti yeah. tribes people and yeah. I think. Um, you know, I still think of the zoo as this amazing place, um, yeah. not only architecturally, historically. Um, I've never been there and not been amazed. I mean, um, and yeah. I know it has a troubled, troubled history. So, well, I you think know, that's my, actually, my, it's, an, it's an interesting point because I love bringing my kids there. And I think yeah. that's all the more reason to do exactly what you're talking about, right. which, which is to not only make amends, but to make it clear that, 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 that they had this history and, and what it means and how we progressed past it or we, we want to progress past it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I just, I think it's ultimately it comes down. I mean, I think zoos, I mean, the Bronx Zoo tr generates a tremendous amount of, of, of revenue. And so I think at this point, yeah, there's, there really doesn't seem, I think there just has to be administrative will i think there's still a really you know a really kind of embarrassment and yeah. um you know avoidance of that history um yeah. and i think that you know there's other institutions um the museum of natural history right uh they're all you know finally beginning to reckon with this and i think it's important um that it happens uh you yeah. know i don't it's unfortunate that these things take so long um, and right. that, uh, 
it, it always does take, you know, um, a lot of pressure to, to make those things happen. Um, but certainly other institutions have done it. Um, and I think have learned from it and I think it's important and, yeah. um, hopefully that will, you know, take place, yeah. um, uh, in the near future. It, um, the other, yeah, the, the other irony to this is that while, while this, while we're talking, the last six or seven months, really since January of 2021, there's just been this huge fervor over critical race theory and yeah. just diversity, equity, and inclusion taught in schools. The 1619 project sort of reframing right. when our economy actually started functioning and how it formed the country we live in today and how it was built on the backs of enslaved African people. And, and that's causing like a national rift, right? It's breaking apart that mixed with COVID. Yeah. It's breaking apart our nation in some ways. And, and, and it's just, it's ironic that we're talking about such an obvious fix. And yet there are these very massive, the same argument essentially is taking place nationally. Uh, and I just, I, don't, yeah. I find that, I find that fascinating and also horrifying uh, that we even have to Yeah, have I, I, sp I, this was about 10 years ago, but I, I I presented a paper at University of Virginia at UVA, and when I was there, one of the art historians took us on um, a tour of the campus, and you know, basically showed where the slave quarters were, how um, Jefferson's house yes. was essentially a plantation house, and the, the central quad of the university is. Um, is essentially Jefferson's home. And she would, you know, she she had really developed or done a lot of research over the years. And she was, um, I, I don't want to say harassed, but she was definitely confronted by uh, older people in the community about speaking about slavery in that. And it was just, you know, it was surprising because she, I don't, you know, there was no intention on her part of, of it wasn't an, an activist approach at the history. It was simply um, a presentation of that history. Uh, and yeah. it was, you know, the, the, the slave quarters, the houses, all of the architecture and structure that was present there. And almost, you know, it was interesting to see the response. You know, people did not want to confront it, yeah. even though it was right in, you know, right there. Um, yeah in many ways yeah. well let's i just want to shift gears a bit though because i did want to talk about um this idea of surveillance and um uh, let me just bring up this um can you see this presentation yes okay wonderful yeah. yes and i want to talk about specifically this image here but um first i just wanted to talk about the idea of how social order is maintained because you know um we we're talking about like facial recognition last week we talked about eye tracking surveillance in general is becoming um it's it's moving online it already has moved online and it's becoming uh, empowered by algorithms and it's just, it, it is as you mentioned as you may note it's a very scary thing and it conjures these dystopian futures that you can find in, you know, 1984, Philip K. Dick's many novels, Neil Stevenson's novels, um, yeah. all as a means, yeah, all as a means of social control. In fact, it's funny, like Facebook recently rebranded themselves as meta. They want to get into right. the metaverse, which actually comes from a Neil Stevenson novel. I, whether that's ironic or not, right. I can't tell. I can't tell anymore. <laughs> but anyway, the, it all adds up to squashing dissent right i think that's like the fear amongst um at least the activist community but certainly just people as it squashes dissent but it also limits and compartmentalizes the human experience it's in you know before the renaissance right the you know before the invention of science all power was sort of abrogated to the the, the monarchy right the king um, exactly right and and it's and as a result, it, like the way that social order, it was actually pretty simple. Social, social order was just maintained through punishment, right? Torture, execution, yeah. uh, pretty simple one, you know, one, two relationship. But it was really, 
the the Black Plague, right? These massive, uh, it's ironic mm -hmm. that we're in a current pandemic, but these massive worldwide, or at least Europe-wide Europe epidemics that killed yeah. hundreds of thousands of people um, over a course of centuries. And then later, of course, there was the, um, there was small smallpox and, and cholera and other sorts of, you know, diseases. Um, this is, this is Peter Bruegel's The Triumph of Death, which is, oh, I love part of, well. yeah, oh, it's great. I mean, it's also, it's also terrifying. I mean, it's just terrifying me right. as, as a child, <laughs> but if you look in like the lower left, I just happened to re-notice this the other day. If you look in the lower left, there's uh -huh. a, a king, there's a king, um, sort of like laid out in a ermine robe and there's, you know, a, a skeleton hovering over him. And then I just noticed yeah, there was right. like a, um, there's an hourglass that, that the oh, skeleton yeah. is holding and the time is all up. <laughs> so it's like interesting. This, this, it, I think the message that Bruegel is making is that with the Black Death, essentially came the end, uh, the end of most monarchies in Europe. Their respect for monarchies went away because here were these horrible diseases that a king with all his or her in terms of a queen, their powers did nothing. They couldn't stop right. the, the plague through edict or through torturing or, or punishing. And boy, did they try, yeah. but it, it didn't work, right? And, it, and right. the only thing that really did work, the only thing that could control plagues was an immersion science at the time. And that's quarantine, right? Data analysis, mm -hmm. what we call contract tracing today. Right. Um, very right. recently, in fact, um, and a regimented society to control the spread of an unseen enemy. In other words, discipline and med in this case, medical surveillance, right? That was the only thing that could uh, really stop the spread of diseases. And this points to the beginning of how what Michel Foucault called the medical gaze was institutionalized, right. like hospital scientists, doctors. It, it became yeah. a gaze on society that was seen as a very positive thing, obviously. Um, yeah. And and it's really part and parcel of how we as a society move towards a discipline model of control as opposed to a punishment model of control. We also moved away yeah. from monar monarchies and towards liberal democracy. Uh, and ironically, seem we seem to be moving the other direction these days. But in the case of the cholera epidemic in the 1850s in London, there's like a triumph of data science, right? This particular image right here was yeah. was a map made by John Snow, um, who, who wasn't a trained, I found out he wasn't a trained uh, epidemiologist. There really weren't epidemiologists back then. He sort of like mm -hmm. invented the science, but he made this brilliant deduction by, <clears throat> excuse me, by um, re interviewing people in, in the area, interviewing hospitals, and, and tracing where they had been, where they, where they went for work, where they ate, where they drank. He, he was able to yeah. trace a cholera epidemic, the source of it, to an actual well pump, sort of like in the middle of this map, uh, but wow. the well pump's also to the right. This is the, it's still there mm -hmm. today. It's like a testament to data wow. science. And it's pretty amazing, right? This was like a triumph of surveillance, right? This is a very positive yeah. spin on, yeah. And then with, I mean, with I, yeah, sorry. Go no, um, I mean, I think the important thing to remember, um, the phrase that I always think of is the Deleuze's phrase of liberating and enslaving forces. Um, I mean, I think these technologies, right, ha are very powerful, right? They can do a, a good degree of, of, of good. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, China contact tracing and their response to um, to COVID and their ability to overcome it, I mean, came yeah. from uh, their experience with uh, pandemics uh, prior. And I think it's important to remember that it's not just a negative thing, but, a, you know, it has potential for a lot of positive things as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I... Sorry, it, but I, I, I... Yeah, no, I totally... No, agree. I just didn't uh, want to interrupt you. <laughs> you were, no, it's fine. I think, talking no, it's, about... Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, hmm. So this is all part, like with the enlightenment, you know, which is just on the, the, the tail of all of this came a more reasoned approach uh, that introduced this relatively new concept of discipline, right? And it was yeah. meant to produce what Michel Foucault called, uh, he termed them docile bodies, right? right. And which are not just prisoners, um, which is one of the things he focused on in terms of, of, of prison environments, 
uh, as in here, this is a picture of Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon, which was a, it's like a, a massive prison in which uh, a circular prison and prisoners are stored, you know, sort of like they're stuck in cages all around the extremities of a, of a round building. And then in the center is a, essentially like a, a, a guard tower. And in the tower would be like little telescope, a telescope that the guards could look into any room of this prison and see all the prisoners at any one time. And, and there's no way that, it, that the, you know, the, the, the idea, the conceit is that no one guard could look at every single prisoner at the same time, but the prisoners don't right. know that. They don't know when they're being watched and therefore it's incumbent upon them to be behave at all times because at any one of those moments they could be watched. Um, this was a real, this was a real thing, right? In fact, I have an image here of, this was Eastern State Penitentiary, which I think closed in like the, as recently as the 80s, the late, early, I'm sorry, early 80s, I think. But they had yeah. a, an actual panopticon um, and these were common across the US. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's several of them. Um, they were seen as these sort of triumphs of the penal system. <laughs> Excuse yeah, me, but- um, they're... There's yeah. yeah, there's prisons modeled in in Cuba uh, after yeah. the Panopticon. There's many kind of instances of this model yeah. being being adopted. Yeah, and they're real things uh, that I think have fallen out of favor. But um, the, Foucault made this point that you know we're kind of living in a Panopticon, right? I mean, we're all because of the yeah. society we live in. We're we're because of social norms, because of a lack of any monarchy and and just um, a pretty visible social culture, it's income we don't we no, none of us know when we're being watched and therefore it's incumbent upon us to sort of behave because we'd rather we, we would rather um, stay in step with society than risk the uh, embarrassment really of step of stepping out and doing something, either illegal or just um, going against any kind of social mores, right? So there's a sort of implicit self-imposed discipline uh, through a metaphorical yeah. panopticon, right? And this was Foucault's writing yeah. in the 70s, but this is sort of where he's coming from. Um, at the same time, Indeed, like because, yeah. because of the birth of photography, uh, it made images, very photo photorealistic images of people much more common, right? So. Indeed, yeah. the, me the medical became a lot more granular as a result. So this is this is an example of Alfa Alphonse Bertillon's synoptic table of physiognomic traits. This 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 goes yeah. back to 19, 1909. So right around the time that Otabenge was was sort of essentially put on display in the Bronx Zoo and his measurements. I noticed you mentioned that he hit his height, his weight. Yeah. you know, you know his like all the things you right. would, you'd attribute to us to a a something in a cage or something in a jar, like a specimen. Uh, that yes. was actually, Definitely. it's pretty, it was pretty common back then. And Bertillon created yeah. uh, these simplified data sets of different markers to identify individuals based on things like the shape of their eyes, the measurements of their foreheads, their, no their noses, their mouths, their ears. And this identification system uh, was called uh, Bertillonage. And it was used at first, I think, for for medical reasons. Um, here's right. another example. Here's like a breakout of like a lot of different things. I mean, <laughs> they incredible. were very, very granular. We're talking about every aspect. In fact, if you just look in the upper left, uh, there's like this ear, and and there's like this almost like right. twenty or yeah, thirty data insane. data points just for the just for the yeah. ear. And, his claim was that you could not just record people, but you could even predict things about people through this. This is sort of where yeah. this led, this predictive science. But the the real value in this uh, is that the it all got reduced to numbers, right? So it was just, it could be packaged into just data. Um, Indeed, yeah. which, And that meant it could all be shared by telegraph, thus creating a, you know, a national surveillance network for the very first time um, and, and of course, uh, uh, police departments around the, the country love this because here they not only, you know, with the mugshot, which was a relatively recent invention, uh, it could be used to identify people. They also had a whole system of biometrics, right? All this, all this data about not just complexion and hair color and beard color, but like the shape of the eyes, right? The, 
the distance between them, the shape of the nose. Yeah. Um, and it became, and, and this became essentially our first national surveillance apparatus, right? This first official apparatus for surveilling and recording people. And it became- And now, yeah. now I mean, and all of the technologies that we're using now really do stem from these kinds of measurements, this kind of um, mm -hmm. approach to organizing the data. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's amazing that, that uh, I mean, they, I love these images of yeah. the, the filing cabinets of, of like storing yeah. or, or treating, you know, of piecing together or making a person in a, in a, in a sense divided into all, all of these tiny yeah. pieces. Um, yeah, compartmentalized, and I mean, it, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, algorithms are, although they're, they have maybe uh, a second or third level of sophistication, um, we're still dealing with kind of probabilistic uh, results and i think this idea that you can somehow predict um the future of crime all of these um ways that assumptions are made and algorithms are organized all re you know really end up reinforcing uh institutional problems already we haven't really yeah. kind of uh thought about newer ways of structuring these things and that's really part of the problem and yeah, I mean, it, it seems like you have to start somewhere, right? And and looking at what's been done is one way to do that. But it's interesting that that uh, you know I was completely um, surprised when I I began doing the composite portraits and then found the images of of Francis Galton's comport, uh, composite portraits and was just amazed, like, oh, this has already been done. Um, yeah. You know, and I think that was certainly a, a point for me. And, I, and there's a lot of artists that kind of deal with the landscape of the face as this kind of mapped territory. And I think, you know, this began, you know, in the the late uh, 19th century. Um, yeah. If, and yeah. probably goes even further back, but, you know, it's it, hard to. Yeah, this was particularly prone to, um, I'm not just bias, but just, you know, you take measurements of one person's eyes in Detroit, and then that first same person shows up in Chicago, and there's a different person measuring, right? And that that measurement could be off. Right. And then these sort of totally. these yeah. measurements, they fluctuate, and then they become the error sort of, there's a feedback error that just grows, and it just yeah. becomes incredibly, this is really one of the, that particular thing is one of the reasons that fingerprints started getting taken, because that's a lot harder to to break right oh. fingerprints are used today right to because they are yeah. very accurate and, and they are though not completely distinct between human beings they're mostly distinct right enough so that in a you know that's country, you know that's certainly something that's there was um this was in simone brown's book uh dark mm -hmm. matters but they're they're actually are similarities and it there yeah. you know there is a probabilistic nature to fingerprinting as well uh sure. even though it's much more accurate it's um it's easier to um to model and to take yeah. data from but there's still you know the, the very real possibility that you know one more than one person can have similar sure. uh, fingerprints so that was yeah. you know those things are alarming and and often you know not shared right with the general public so you right. know there can be there can be an image uh, a surveillance image a facial recognition um mm -hmm. component uh, a fingerprint component and even though you know the intersection of all of those kinds of ways of recording identity um are may add up to point to a single person it could still be wrong um yeah i think yeah. that is something that is not comforting to uh law enforcement obviously um yeah. but i think yeah i think it's a, it's important to remember like none of these things are absolutely a hundred percent uh accurate no. and precise um no and, i agree yeah um, i agree 
Um, and, it's, me... and it takes on. Sorry to uh, just want to quickly say. Yeah. It also yeah. takes on this 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 um, this aura of objectivity that I think existed in the late nineteenth century, right, and that exists yeah. today, right. It's like, yeah. oh no, these these things are so precise. Um, yeah that they are you know they they've been removed from biased or from any kind of leaning in one direction or another and that's not the yeah. case at all yeah um, no for sure there is a there is an undue trust in science and it, it, it it's it's interesting because now here in the 21st century we're facing a, a a distrust and like a almost like a willful ignorance of science it's almost like an inversion of the sort of bravado that we had in the turn of the century um which is also it's just as concern disconcerting you know um yeah so yeah. so uh, as i was saying uh about foucault is he he made this um his theory was that we sort of were self-disciplined because we were living in a world where in, our, in a society where we could all sort of we were all sort of watching each other and we all lived by some kind of social contract. And that that was what, for the most part, limited a lot of aberrant behavior. Um, but I actually, I don't necessarily know if that's still the case. Um, I was, I've been reading this book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zubo. It's, it's surveillance capitalism was coined by her to describe market-driven, a market-driven process where the raw material is our personal data and the capture and production of this data relies on mass surveillance of the internet. Uh, this, this surveillance is carried out by companies that provide us free online services. I say free with air quotes, yeah. um, such as like search engines like Google or social media platforms like Facebook, now Meta. Um, these companies collect and scrutinize our online behaviors, what we like, what we dislike, what we click through to, to other links our search queries for sure, the social networks we're on and who we're friends with, our purchases on online re retailers, and even our, our own images with, and our physiognomy, which we were just talking about, right? Selfies yeah. are, are essentially like the mugshot of uh, this new capitalist movement, right? And they use this to produce mm -hmm. data that can be further used for commercial purposes. So the in the book, um, this book, she makes the case that and Google has said this, that early on in the Google search, uh, in the development of Google search, they used our behaviors, what we searched for, and filtered that information back into certain un undisclosed algorithms to determine yeah. what else we might want to look for based on associations, right? And the, right. the argument, I mean, that sounds so great on paper, it like makes the search function better. Right, because in yeah. addition to what we literally search for, it can make suggestions about other stuff, and that seems so helpful. But um, we don't necessarily understand how it all works, right? That's proprietary information. And her point is right. that, so for example, right? This, the, so someone sees <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this could be on any social network. Someone sees a, an outfit, accessory, shoes posted on Facebook. They text the person to find out where they got it from researches online, signs up for information about it. They, at the same time, because they signed up, they receive a certain about like a 20% off voucher for whatever it is. They try right. on the shoes in a retail store uh, or they purchase the shoes online with a voucher. They get the shoes mm -hmm. they post it in, they post the picture on Instagram and tweet or tweet about it, uh, that right. they have this item. And it's like this endless feedback loop. Um, she also makes this point, Zuboff makes this point that they use targeted ads based on this in this behavior to algorithmic algorithmically predict what we desire, when we desire right. it, and often before we are we ourselves actually desire it or we know we're gonna desire sure, sure. it. That's yeah. and essentially that the ability to do that is why they have so much market capital because we are not the customers. Uh, we're just the raw material, right? The customers are advertisers. And if they can sell predictive yeah. information, future right. future think about their consumers, I mean, that is gold. There is nothing more valuable yeah. for advertisers, right? And also because big tech has automated and exacted near complete control of this proprietary information, 
and control of what we experience mm-hmm. online, right? What we're actually we're all privy to via our searching yeah. and clicking and buying. They're, all, they're free to assert a new kind of power on our behavior. And this is something that Foucault never right. could have predicted, right? Yeah, pre- the, yeah that's a very good not, point. Yeah. And this, this is, this, this, uh, Zuboff calls this instrumentarian power. This is her term for right. it. And my, my question to you would be, um, given everything you said and the prevalence of all this surveillance technology like facial recognition, uh, eye tracking, uh, all, all, you know, the Apple Watch and other sort of, it's not showing up, the wearable technology that records our medical, essentially our, the, it, it enhances the medical gaze. Is, is, yeah. is that, yeah. you know, my question, I mean, I'm just thinking, does Google, Facebook, other big tech, do they even need any of that? Because it, fe- it feels like we are ourselves broadcasting our behavior to the, to the, you know, the central part of the panopticon, which is big tech and, and, and social, yeah, I mean, and social I mean, media, think, right? Yeah. I mean, we're, I think we're, we're giving our own mugshots away is my point, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I'm critical of and skeptical about all these technologies, but I have a social media account. I have an Instagram account. Um, I know these things are, you know, I know all of my gestures, et cetera, is being recorded. I I have, you know, I'm learning more and more. I, I, I mean, I've read articles where they're trying to predict health um, information or health conditions based solely on gestures and my interaction with my phone, uh, and it's you know wow. crossing that data with. So I mean I think it's it's kind of like this intersection of the public relations industry in the early twentieth century or mid twentieth century and kind of networking that information now with um, a patient, right? That's constantly being the data on that patient is almost updated on a live basis. Yes. Right. So it's like, we're yeah. not even going to the doctor to be subjected to the medical gaze anymore. It's, it's everywhere, <laughs> you know, yeah. as yeah. you know, just as surveillance is and, um, and yeah. And I think these technologies are so powerful and, and, I think, I mean, social media as an example, it's like, yeah, you get to see your friend from fourth grade that you haven't talked to in 30 years, right? And it's like, how can you not want to be open to that um, experience? You know, if, it, if it's, it allows us to be in touch, right, in ways that probably we wouldn't have been 20, 30 years ago. And also um, is oddly building a kind of community in digital space mm-hmm. that can be monitored and watched at all times. And I think yeah. I think we all kind of suppress the impulse for privacy, right, to be able to engage in that community, right? Um, and I mean, I, um, I mean, I don't know if that, w- I think, I mean, I, my overall is a, a sense of, um, it's just frightening. <laughs> is the the, yeah. the most um, not only that because now you know if you're applying for a job or looking at like there's more information online about you yeah. than ever before probably right. and so yeah. people are making critical decisions based on that data right and we're talking about tiny fragments of your personality or your abilities right and decisions or important decisions are being made based on those so that if anything it just it's just scary and it, i don't know you know i don't it's difficult to imagine i mean i've thought about quitting all of social media right and getting rid of my cell phone even um but i've never i haven't been able to do it you know and i think it it's a weird it's it's difficult to think as now as a professor and teaching students who have grown up around this technology since day one it's difficult for them to imagine before this. And it's also difficult for me to imagine. When I mm. look back at college, I was like, how did I ever live without a cell phone? Or how did I ever live without email? You know? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I the, the only response I can think of is just scary. I mean, I, um, you know, knowing what I searched for last week at two o'clock in the morning and having that 
information live on a server somewhere attached to all this other information is painting a picture of me that I have little control over, right? Yeah. And that yeah. Um, uh, is going to impact my life at, at some point. Um, yeah. And so the, the question is when and, and how, and, and how can I, is there a way for me to resist that or, or um, yeah. counter it? It's way. interesting because in the in that book, the, the uh, surveillance capitalism, there's an there's an interesting story about just that idea that the right to be forgotten, right? That do we right. have a right to have that information expunged? Should we desire it to be at any point? Yeah. And actually, in Spain, which I would say is probably more progressive than the United States is um, about these mm -hmm. types of issues, they actually. Uh, passed a law that all, because they, they yeah. sued Google and they passed a law that allowed people to request to have their information deleted. And that's becoming more common nowadays with public policy. And so I think the good thing is that, yes, it's frightening, but the, but the good thing is that with public policy, there's a response. Yeah. Yeah. There's a response. Yeah. I mean, I, in facial recognition, certainly there, there has been a good response to it they people know it's flawed it's racist it's gen, you know yeah. it's gender biased etc and they've you know very quickly responded in a way that's concrete and that can prevent it from damaging yeah. people's lives and i think that's important certainly but yeah there are other countries that are seem a lot more, more uh cognizant of the dangers of the technology yeah. and are responding to it um but yeah, I just got uh, the uh, surveillance capitalism book, and and I think I got a couple pages into it. it was like, yeah, oh it's God, very this dense. It's gonna be really scary. <laughs> it's very dense. Well, it's just I can't, like I can't yeah, get through it. So um, every every page is like some new hor like horrifying and yet very inspiring revelation. So it's hard to like, yeah, it's really hard to get through. Well, but she it's gave not that a fun read. Early on in the book, she gives that example of the the uh, black person holding the thermometer, and the search for that yeah. would right. reveal would would immediately point to it being a gun. And if you right. searched with a, a white person, right, holding the same instrument, the the search algorithms uh, shift in another way. And it was just like that's that alone could get somebody killed. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, or sue and or both. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, this has yeah. been great. Thank you so much, Dennis. I really appreciate it. Uh, likewise. Do you have anything else that you wanted to uh, um, say? Or? No, I think the, the and this, the one last thing I'll say is just to, yeah. de I think developing a critical consciousness is really instrumental and important, um, particularly for young people who, you know, have made their or they put their lives on online, so to speak, uh, to be cautious and to be yeah. to understand how these these platforms are not perfect and can impact your life negatively, it, um, positively, hopefully, right? But yeah. um, but they have the potential to to do it negatively. It's important to be aware of that. Very true. Well, thank you again, and thank you to the Turbo right. Foundation for. Uh, for funding this and allowing us to have Indeed. these very these very deep conversations. Uh, I'll see everybody uh, next week.